For people into video games growing up in the mid to late 90s, it usually came down to two major companies, either Sony or Nintendo, which then meant that you either owned a PlayStation or a Nintendo 64. We will change the system. For me, it was the PlayStation above all else, the PS1 was the first gaming console I spent any serious time invested in, and the early entries for franchises like Metal Gear Solid and Grand Theft Auto helped ensure that this would be a hobby of mine for years to come. As far as first-person shooters go, both the PS1 and the 64 had their strengths. On the PlayStation, you had Medal of Honor, Disruptor, and Power Slave. Then on the 64, you had GoldenEye, Perfect Dark, and Doom 64. Sony had the awesome and sleek DualShock controller, a design template which is still being used to this day. And then the 64 had the iconic Trident, a controller which, despite what naysayers might tell you, is actually kind of intuitive and made controlling certain games feel like second nature. That's a new course record. And I thought, since I did a video on first person shooters for the PS1 a few months back, it might be finally time to get around to checking out the titles on the other end of that spectrum with the Nintendo 64. That's a good idea. The only one I won't be covering is 1998's Forsaken, and that's not because it's bad, but because it's one of those very few games that gives me insane motion sickness if I play it for more than 30 seconds. Either way though, with everything still left, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get into it. The games of Nintendo 64. Right, so first off the bat, we've got, unfortunately, what's one of the worst games in the 64's library, and that's Armarine's Project Swarm. Developed by Acclaim Studios in 1999 and comparable only to Cystic Acne in the list of things that tormented teenagers back in the 90s. <laughs> What's really shocking is that Armourines has all the elements for what should have been a really fun shooter. It's a game about super soldiers decked out in futuristic suits of armour, fighting back against insectoid aliens to save the world using guns built into their arms. You can play missions across different locations, like in Siberia, Egypt, and then the alien hive for the finale, with more pit stops than a Kentucky tour. Now the first thing you're having to choose is the playable character, playing as either Tony Lewis or Myra Lane, both of which are more or less the same, with the main difference being their basic weapons. On the one hand, literally, Myra has a machine gun and a grenade launcher, whereas on the other foot, Tony has a plasma gun and a rocket launcher. And you'll be using their primary weapon 99% of the time, firstly because they have infinite ammo, but secondly because explosive weapons do far more harm than good. And having every single enemy run right up to you makes splash damage a serious threat. So as a result of this, you more or less just hold down the fire button on that basic weapon 90% of the time, letting the auto-aim do all of the work while you sit there silently re-evaluating all of your life choices. There's also level-specific weapons, like in Egypt you get a staff that looks like something out of Hexen, but these weapons don't utilize the auto-aim system like the primary weapon does, and when you see how this game looks and runs, you'll understand why that's so important. Because yeah, in case it's not completely obvious by this point, Armourines looks and runs like shit, and the graphics are just plain ugly, inside and out. The art style is unappealing with these run-of-the-mill alien designs, textures are bland and blurry, and none of the weapons are all that exciting or fun to use. The second level of the game has you strapped to a gun turret on a moving cart inside a pitch black mineshaft against all these darker coloured aliens, and anyone with some basic common sense and awareness should be able to understand why that doesn't make for riveting visuals. Can't see shit. Even the music is just so forgettable, and I've had more catchy tunes coming out of my ass. This is also one of the many Nintendo 64 games that gives you the option to play in either a high or low quality visual mode, if you've got an expansion pack. And what that basically means is you've got to decide between having crappy visuals but decent performance, or decent visuals but crappy performance. And this might just be a matter of personal preference, but I just can't imagine why you'd ever want to have worse off performance just for the sake of slightly better visuals. The 64 was never really known for having timeless graphics to begin with, and although certain titles can look appealing thanks to their art styles, this is not one of those instances. And Armourines really has to be one of the crappiest looking games on the platform. But what I find to be the biggest hindrance though is that the game has inverted aiming by default and there is no way to turn this off. Which is doubly baffling because the PS1 version has this option. 
The PS1 version also has fully voiced briefing and intermission screens. You know, if you actually care about that stuff. We'll bring you more information as soon as we have it. But having said that, that's about the only improvement that that version has over the 64. And that's a running theme you're going to be seeing in this video, where the PS1 version of a 64 game is often worse off. Now, like I said in my PS1 video, the only real memory I have of this game is that when it came out, a friend of mine brought it to school one day to show it off, only for someone to steal it out of his backpack. And I'm not selling you porky pies, but that really is my only memory when I think back to Armourines. Goody gumdrops. I mean, I sure as shit don't remember this thing for its riveting gameplay, creative level design, or captivating story. It's one of the lowest rated shooters on the Nintendo 64, and... Yeah, there's a reason for that. And all I can do is again give out my heartfelt condolences to the unfortunate kids who were gifted this thing unknowingly from parents or other loved ones who probably meant better. <laughs> While we're on the subject of low-rated games, next up we got the N64 port for John Romero's Daikatana, one of the most infamous shooters of all time. <laughs> But I think I'm one of the few people who's actually pro Daikatana. Even since I first played it all those years ago when it was completely busted. And the reason for that is, I mean, despite all the issues, I've always appreciated the scope and the vision of what Romero was trying to accomplish. He did it. He really did it. It would eventually get the love it deserved when the fair made 1.3 patch restored a lot of the game's original intent. But as we all know, on the PC at the time, things didn't go too well. I hate cemeteries. And they sure hinged their bets on this thing being a bankable franchise, making a port for the Game Boy Color along with the Nintendo 64. And this is an interesting version of Daikatana in the way that it's completely different to how it was on the PC following more or less the same plot and structure, but having entirely unique level design and cinematics due to the limitations of the platform. The story is still mostly the same. You're playing as Hiro Miyamoto, chasing the evil warlord Kage Mishima through different time zones with your gal pal Makiko and your buddy Superfly. Ultimately trying to stop Kage from using the eponymous Daikatana to rewrite history for his own nefarious deeds. Things like altering historical events, causing dissent, and investing in Bitcoin early on before anyone knew about it. You explore four different time periods. You've got futuristic Tokyo, there's ancient Greece, medieval Europe, and then finally modern day San Francisco. The weapons reflect the time you're in as well, with more advanced weaponry in Tokyo and San Francisco, and then more mythical and magical weapons in Greece and Europe, along with the enemies being more suited to the time period as well. The biggest issue though wasn't the levels, the weapons or the enemy designs, it was trying to navigate your AI partners through all these environments, where they'd frequently find themselves like stuck in the scenery, or be unable to even perform a basic task like just getting through a doorway. <laughs> So right off the bat, the biggest change they've made on the 64 is that you've no longer got to worry about your teammates. At all, because they bugger them off entirely. Which, despite being an objective downgrade, is also a subjective upgrade. Considering these guys have the brain power of a TikToker, and getting them through the levels is no longer this massive and perpetual speed bump you've got to contend with. Another big difference is that instead of losing weapons when you change time periods, you now hang on to them for some reason, which is kind of cool, but also kind of pointless because you're not going to be finding ammo for Medusa staff in modern day San Francisco. The game is still very cinematic heavy as well, but the voice acting is now completely removed, using only subtitles now, and the music and animation throughout all of these is incredibly basic. which is actually an area where the 64 was repeatedly beaten out by the PS1, due to the PS1 having that increased storage space on a disc compared to the cartridges. All up, you're looking at about a three or four hour long campaign here, and the inclusion of the leveling up system, which seems to go off every five minutes, really preys on how susceptible we are as human beings to those constant dopamine hits. And as far as first person shooters for the 64 go, it can't really compete to some of the other games we're going to be taking a look at. But then that's also kind of the dilemma when most of these titles are good, if not great. So overall, I'd probably put this at the second worst FPS made for the console, with our Marines obviously being firmly at the bottom. And with there being no remaster yet for either of these, I probably wouldn't recommend wasting your time. Unless, of course, for some reason, you want to be Romero's bitch. Yeah, it wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> Alright, well finally, we're getting to the good stuff, with Doom 64 released in 1997. 
Hands down, one of the best shooters on the platform, and also something that's had a bit of a renaissance in recent years, becoming more and more popular as people have discovered it. Developed by Midway Games, Doom 64 is a really interesting entry in the series because it's a completely standalone title. Taking place after the events of the first game, where Doom Guy is sent back to the USC bases on Mars because the demons have decided to come back for a second round of ass kicking. This gives the player another 30 or so levels to blast through, along with entirely redone enemy and weapon sprites. Not to mention a brand new weapon in the form of the Unmaker. <laughs> Not to be confused with the Undresser, which is the nickname your mum gave me. <laughs> Aside from that, Doom 64 also has a much scarier vibe, introducing more atmospheric lighting effects and a brand new soundtrack by Aubrey Hodges. Well, that was terrifying. And I think people often forget that the original Doom was intended to be a horror game. On the other hand though, you only need to play Doom 64 for a couple of minutes and you can easily recognize why this game scared the absolute shit out of anyone who played it back in the day. I mean, just the lighting effects alone are much more moody and sinister, with great use of shadows and colored lights to create some really haunting backdrops. Doom 64 was notoriously dark for its time as well, which, as was later discovered, is because the people who worked on it apparently played it in the dark all the time on these CRT TVs, which meant that they lit the game based off their own surroundings. However, thanks to modern capture cards and upscalers, you can bypass this handicap pretty easily and admire the really creative level design, not to mention appreciate that more horror-based aspect, you know, as it was originally intended. I will say though that I've never been a huge fan of the new enemy and weapon sprites, only because they do really differ a lot from the PC version, but you still can't deny the artistry and talent behind some of these. The Unmaker is also a pretty damn awesome weapon too, outright hidden in a secret level and then only able to be upgraded by finding further secret level and more hidden items inside those as well. Overall, it's the same gameplay loop from the original PC version, just now with a controller. And that simple repetition of circle strafing combined with firing back at enemies is easy to get the hang of. Not to mention the level design is more complex, which means that even people who are more than familiar with Doom shooting and controls are still going to find something to be challenged by. But the best thing about Doom 64 though, no arch files, which is great because those things can fuck right off. Now, up until a few years back, playing through this was limited to actually hooking up a Nintendo 64 or messing around with the emulators. But thanks to Night Dive Studios, who you're going to hear me mention a whole lot in this video, it's now easily playable on modern systems thanks to a really solid remaster. Not only does this let you play through the original entire campaign, but it also adds in six more maps with a new episode called The Lost Levels. Not to be confused with The Lost Lands from Turok, which we'll get to soon enough. I am Turok! And I think the ultimate compliment I can give to Midway Games is that playing Doom 64 on PC with all the bells and whistles shows that it's still a solid shooter that plays really well. I mean, the fact that I can sit there and play through a 16-year-old game and completely lose track of the time is a testament to how well it's aged. It is kind of weird how this thing didn't rate as well as you might think it would back in 97, getting a mid-70s aggregate review score, which is probably the result of it coming out months after Goldeneye did. But also more than that too, this is probably just a classic case of gaming journalists being complete idiots and not knowing what they're talking about. I mean, the guy who reviewed this for IGN, for instance, more or less said that it added nothing worthwhile if you've played those original games. Yeah, alright, whatever you say, Pierce Schneider. Pierce Schneider? Wait a second, is that the same guy from that old reaction meme? Shit. So yeah, dog, there's a reason why people still talk so fondly about Doom 64. And if you watch this video and only have one takeaway, well, then I hope that it's that you're going to seek out a copy of this thing and check it out. <laughs> Next up, we got Duke Nukem 64, one of the only two Duke games ever made for the platform, alongside Duke Nukem Zero Hour. Unlike Zero Hour though, which was a totally new third-person shooter, Duke Nukem 64 is more or less a port of that original PC version, just with some key differences. 
It's kind of hard to overstate the impact that Duke Nukem 3D had at the time. I mean, not only was it one of the first games to put you in these believable and realistic environments, but it was also one of the earliest first-person shooters to have a protagonist with such a large personality. With Duke's countless one-liners and all the various adult content speckled throughout each episode being something we really hadn't seen done before. Also setting the groundwork for the games that followed with Blood, Shadow Warrior and even Sin. Who's your daddy? And all of this is exactly part of what makes Duke 64 unique, in the way that almost all of that stuff has been heavily censored if not outright removed. With Nintendo I guess trying to keep their whole family friendly image intact. This means that the adult theater in Hollywood Holocaust, for instance, is now just a theater. And the porno store in Red Light District is instead a gun store. Weirdly too, though, the wanking booths in the back are still wanking booths, only now I guess people are rubbing one out to women dressed up in army fatigues. That's a challenging wank. <laughs> When you find your way to the strip club near the end of the level, you'll see it's now replaced with a Duke burger, complete with a working kitchen and a parking lot. Duke doesn't call the aliens bastards anymore when they shoot down his ride. This time, instead, they're called scum, which, yeah, really doesn't have the same effect. Damn, those alien scum are gonna pay for shooting up my ride. It's like me referring to your mum as a working lady. <laughs> yeah, she's a working lady, all right, working on D's nuts. All of those cinematics after each boss fight are now just still images with the sound effects laid over the top of them. And speaking of boss fights, the Emperor during the final battle is now polygonal as opposed to just being a 2D sprite. Another big change is that when you come across all those women trapped in cocoons, you can actually now rescue them, as opposed to just, I don't know, leaving them behind. And then finally, all the graphic violence like exploding corpses and giblets has been toned down as well, making this really the most family-friendly version of Duke Nukem 3D yet. What is funny to consider too is that Duke Nukem Total Meltdown on the PS1 still kept pretty much all of that stuff intact. However, in that version, you are dealing with absolutely woeful performance, so it's a bit of a trade-off. Another huge difference with Duke 64 is that, kind of like Doom 64, all of the weapon sprites are completely changed, along with certain weapons being different entirely. Cool. So for starters, you've still got the pistol and the shotgun, but the Ripper Cannon is now replaced with dual SMGs. And instead of the RPG in the fifth slot, you've now got a grenade launcher. You still do get a missile launcher, which, let's be honest, is more or less the RPG, but then this weirdly replaces the Devastator. And then instead of the freeze thrower, you've got the all new plasma cannon, which can be fired semi auto or charged up like a BFG. To make it even more complex, there's different ammo types for the pistol and the shotgun, with dum dum rounds and explosive shells, making it the only Duke 3D game to use this feature. And I've always really enjoyed these minor changes in this version because it makes replaying through the same game again for the countless time somewhat interesting. Even just coming across all those subtle level design differences they've had to add in to keep the whole thing PG-13. Like in the third episode for some reason, how the karaoke bar is now replaced with what's very clearly a reference to the Blues Brothers. You're the good old boys. Seeing Atomic Edition enemies like the Alien Drone showing up here too also reminds me of playing Doom on the PS1 and seeing Revenants and Chain Gunners in that first episode. <laughs> it even has a remixed soundtrack of the original PC version. And look man, I complain about a lot of things, but getting a new version of Grab Bag is not one of them. <laughs> Like a lot of other N64 titles, there's also the option for couch co-op. And there's always been something kind of hilarious about this mode, seeing pallets swap Duke Nukem sprites, ice skating all over the place that just makes it really fun to play. About the only downside this version has is the complete absence of a quick save, which, I mean, look, it ain't the worst thing in the world, but there are some levels here and there, especially in the second episode, that are just rife with these sudden death traps, and that can make those levels really frustrating. I mean, Duke 3D on the PC was designed with manual saves in mind. It's really part of what offsets the frustration with those random deaths, is that you're really only losing a few minutes of your time when you're actually killed. So lacking that basic feature in Duke 64, it does kind of suck. Either way though, despite all of that, this is really a solid version of an all-time GOAT. And if you do want to check this thing out, well, then I've got good news, because there's an easy way to do it, thanks to an absolute lad who's ported it across to the PC. And if you've got a source port like eduke32, you can play through the whole thing with a mouse and a keyboard, appreciating all of the new and edited content without having to fiddle around with an actual 64 to get it all going. 
And in lieu of Night Dive coming in and remastering it properly, this is as good as it gets. Hail to the King indeed. Now, if you watched my video on first-person shooters for the PS1, you probably remember me saying about how awful that version of Hexen was. Truly, one of the worst things ever made by another human being, and if there's a better way to totally undersell such an underappreciated game, well, I've yet to see it. You might also remember me saying that the N64 port for Hexen wasn't too shabby. And having played that again for this video, I still stand by that. Hexen for the Nintendo 64 was developed by Software Creations, and it's about the closest you can get to actually playing it on a PC, with a somewhat steady frame rate, quick saves, and level architecture that's practically unchanged. Choosing to play as those three different heroes, you're on a long and confusing quest to stop the second serpent rider Korax. Worship me, and I may yet be merciful. Navigating through a dark, gothic fantasy setting, and if you're at all familiar with the PC version, playing through this thing feels like putting on an old pair of jeans. To the point that it almost does the original justice, which is good. Because the more Hexen fans we have, the better chance it has of finally getting a reboot or a remake. But even better than that is that this version supports local co-op. So if you've got a second controller and a willing partner, the two of you can run around the game together. Dutch ridering each other and trying to remember where the fuck you're supposed to be going. And it's a scientific fact that video games, a lot like recreational drugs, are way more fun with friends. The only real downside to this port is that it is an absolute whore when it comes to using up safe space, taking up almost an entire goddamn memory pack for one file, like some kind of greedy bitch. Still though, if this was the only way you could play Hexen at the time, well, then it could have been a damn sight worse. I mean, yeah man, you could have been stuck with that PS1 version or the Saturn version. Yikes. Are you ready to die? Ultimately though, Hexen on the 64 still got pretty average reviews. But the reason for that is actually pretty obvious. I mean, what do you think came out barely two months after it? Well, I'll give you a hint. It starts with G and it ends in old and I. Yes, I know that H actually comes after G, but that last sentence just seemed to segue so well into Goldeneye. Yeah, that's right, son. 1997 was the year that Goldeneye 007 was unleashed on the world. And from this point on, the landscape of console shooters would never be the same. <laughs> Developed by Rare, it was a pivotal turning point for the industry, because it really helped to make the argument that first-person shooters on a console could match what was happening on the PC, and really made it a compelling case. At least, you know, until Half-Life came out a year later. Still though, Goldeneye wasn't only just a decent shooter, but it was a great movie time as well. Effortlessly recreating some of those iconic scenes from the film and adapting them into a playable format. The opening mission, for instance, is the entire damn infiltration from the movie's prologue, including dropping in on some poor arsehole trying to take a shit, to ending with 007 and 006 getting ambushed by the Russians, with Bond having to make an explosive exit. The kind of exit that's usually limited to doing a runner at a Taco Bell restroom. This was the first Bond movie I ever saw in the cinemas too, and a movie that I also blame for getting me attracted to murderous, psychopathic femme fatales in bathrobes. Crikey. And while the game didn't let me almost bang Famke Jansen, being able to feel like I got to capture most of the same vibes and the feeling of the movies in the palm of my hand was hard not to appreciate. Speaking of that too, a lot of people often criticise the Nintendo 64's controller and games specifically like this, which is something that I've just never really understood. Simply because, after a little bit of customising, controlling Bond in this game feels as smooth as any modern shooter does, with precise shots and movement being mostly seamless. It definitely helped you popularise that whole control scheme of a player using their right thumb for aiming and then their left hand for moving and strafing, which is something that it just doesn't get enough credit for. I should also probably mention the soundtrack, which really is one of the all-time greats. And while a lot of people always praise the pause theme, and rightfully so, I think that track during the facility is still the absolute peak. What was also really interesting about Goldeneye was the approach it took to missions and the difficulty modes. So not only would the difficulty mode affect enemy intelligence, their accuracy and the damage they did, but it also added in more challenging objectives for the player to complete. 
to the point that the highest difficulty mode, Double O Agent, is legitimately hard to beat, taking a combination of skill, patience, and trial and error to get through. It's kind of weird too to think that Thief the Dark Project came out a year later and more or less did the same thing. And I don't know who was onto it first, but I've always found it interesting how both of these games had the same concept in relatively the same time period. Despite all those innovations though, GoldenEye is also kind of aged like milk in some pretty big ways, especially if you're playing it on an actual 64. For starters, it looks and often runs like complete shit with an inconsistent frame rate, making accurate shots really tricky. And even on a modern capture card with a good SCART cable and a decent upscaler, certain missions just look absolutely awful to the point that it's an outright handicap. Some of those stealth missions and escorting Natalia have become legendary due to their difficulty and there's a reason for that. And spending 15 minutes on one of these missions only to fail it right near the end because of a simple error was just something that was beyond irritating. GoldenEye also comes from that era where a lot of games didn't use checkpoints, and health items are also non-existent as well, instead limited to one or two armor pickups per mission. Which meant that if you ever fucked up and took too much damage, you were pretty much screwed from that point on. I think it's really a matter of Rare having all these visions for certain aspects of the gameplay, but then also being limited by the technology of the time which is why some of the escorting and those stealth mechanics don't really show their age too well, and the frequent lack of hand-holding and not even just explaining basic mechanics ain't helping either. In fact, it wasn't even until I was in my late teens, for instance, that I learned how gunfire and detection works in some of those stealth missions. More than that though, some of these goals and objectives are just downright obtuse. I mean, I'll never forget playing through that mission in St. Petersburg, for instance, and wandering around that graveyard of monuments for what felt like an eternity, before then randomly just fighting Zukovsky in some random shipping container. There's even a later mission when you're somehow supposed to know that he's hiding off in a little building somewhere, and stuff like this just seems like it's confusing for no good reason. And things like this are some of the reasons why, when someone goes back and tries to play GoldenEye now for the first time, why some of its appeal is just going to go right over their head. Because, yeah, unsurprisingly, these 1997 mechanics and design principles feel like they've come out of 1997 and not always in a good way. And I just feel like when people look back at GoldenEye and talk about it fondly, they're not really talking about the game itself, but more the positive impact that the game had on their lives. And that's really what makes GoldenEye such an important game, is the longer lasting effect that it's had on gamers, and that legacy that still lingered over two decades later. I mean, that four player split screen multiplayer mode has become the stuff of legends, man. And even recently, like I had a bunch of mates around for a quick session. And within minutes, muscle memory kicked in and everyone was up to their old tricks. And I don't know about you, but there's not too many decade old games like this where everyone can quickly become so engrossed in just harkens back to that era of gaming where when you played a game with someone, they were actually in the room with you. Yeah, back when if you wanted to trash talk someone, you had to look them in the eyes at the same time. Something that, let me say, is sorely lacking in internet conversations these days. How about the fact that even to this day, GoldenEye is still a game that features heavily in the speedrunning community, with a new world record even being set as recently as a few months back. In terms of its effect on the greater industry, well, I mean, that was felt far and wide. Medal of Honor, for instance, almost owes its entire existence to GoldenEye, with Steven Spielberg saying that one of the main reasons he worked on that series was because he saw his son playing GoldenEye on the 64 and saw the potential. Former devs who worked for Rare would eventually form Free Radical Design to make the Time Splitter series, and you don't need to play those games for very long either to see the influences and mechanics they've taken across. And even the very first level of Time Splitters 2, for instance, is a homage to the Dare mission. Now, GoldenEye has been kind of swept under the rug officially by Nintendo for a while there, with only a scrapped remaster being evidence that they even acknowledge it still exists. So the best way to play it, funnily enough, has been on the PC, through fan-made means that let you play the game in widescreen and at a high resolution. Not to mention with fully integrated mouse and keyboard support, which shows just how well some aspects of it have aged. And this is still the best way to get into some GoldenEye in the current year, probably best off ignoring that recent remaster for the Xbox and the Switch, which has more issues overall than Mad Magazine. <laughs> Or your other option is to play the remake released in 2010 for the Xbox 360. That was sarcasm.
that was fucking dreadful. Regardless though, it's not hard to see how the whole game is still buzzing with innovation and soul, really highlighting that period where shooters in particular were constantly making leaps and bounds. And almost everything you can say about GoldenEye, you can also apply to what's more or less its spiritual sequel, Perfect Dark. what's arguably the best first-person shooter released for the Nintendo 64. Rare took the formula they'd created with GoldenEye in 97 and completely take it to another level in 2000 when this thing finally came out. And to some pretty stiff competition too, man. I mean, 1999 through to 2000 was arguably one of the best eras we got for first-person shooters, with titles like Quake 3, Medal of Honor, Deus Ex, No One Forever, and Daikatana. Son of a gun! So for Perfect Dark to still be considered as groundbreaking as it was in the same 12-month period where we got System Fucking Shock 2, like, that's quite an achievement. <laughs> Now, when I think of GoldenEye, I mostly think of the multiplayer component, but when I think of Perfect Dark, it's all about the campaign. That's not to say Perfect Dark didn't have a decent multiplayer mode, and it brought back the same split-screen action we were all used to. The kind of thing that, again, could make or break friendships. It's just that the campaign is easily one of its strongest aspects, with a gripping storyline involving aliens, conspiracies, and secret organizations hell-bent on world domination, which was the perfect evolution after a Bond game. And really, for all intents and purposes, this is basically a James Bond game anyway. I don't know, well, maybe Jane Bond? Because instead of playing as everyone's favorite male British spy, you're playing as a female British agent named Joanna Dark. Working for the Carrington Institute, going up against the Datadyne Corporation, who are secretly in league with an alien race known as the Skadar. Skadar or Skeeter? Looks like someone doesn't know when to quit. Now that Rare weren't making a game based off a film that already existed, it meant they weren't bound to the limitations of an already existing plot, and could come up with all the wacky and outlandish things they wanted to, which is what they did along with that all-new leading lady in the form of Joanna, who really was too one of the first female protagonists in an FPS, along with Kate Archer in No One Lives Forever and Daniel Fireseed in Turok 3. Sorry, gotta shoot. And what starts out as a pretty straightforward science fiction espionage thriller ends up in a battle where Joanna has to save the entire planet. Plus, it also had a really cute big-headed grey alien named Elvis. Well, Joanna, I am Protector One. But you can call me Elvis. <laughs> I love that little guy. Overall, it just feels like an objective upgrade over Goldeneye. The graphics are better, the levels are longer and more challenging, plus there's actual weapon reload animations now. Instead of the gun just lowering off the screen and then popping back up, magically reloaded. <laughs> The weapons are also far more creative, with the futuristic setting giving them free reign to come up with whatever stuff they want, but still keeping it somewhat grounded in reality. Oops, there goes gravity. Like the CMP, which might be one of my all-time favorite submachine guns, or the laptop gun, which can also serve as a handy turret if you fell it out with the open fire which I still think is a really believable weapon. And in fact, if there ain't someone out there who's already started a Kickstarter to actually create this thing in real life, then I'm going to be sorely disappointed. But do you think we were a little heavy-handed? And I swear that Rare thought that they just had to have another awful weapon to match the club in Goldeneye, which is why they included the Magset pistol, a gun that's so inaccurate, I think that trying to kill someone with a poisonous mushroom takes less time. What are you waiting for? There's far more of a focus on using gadgets during the missions as well, like an actual secret agent would. One point you steal a lab technician's outfit and disguise yourself and sneak around undetected. And if that ain't something that James Bond would do, then I don't know what is. Perfect Dark's missions are also just far more exciting, with there being more shootouts and even more impressive enemy animations during gunfights. I still think it's really cool how you can literally shoot the gun out of someone's hand and then watch them just go right over and pick it back up again. Jeez. Me. Oh, that's actually hilarious. I also feel like a lot of people never really mention the soundtrack, which is full of some absolute bangers. It was composed by the same guys who worked on GoldenEye, and the one track that still lives rent free in my head is the one that plays you when you're escaping from the Datadyne building early on. I mean, that drop when you get ambushed by Cassandra's bodyguard still hits harder than a sock full of marbles to the ball sack. My 
much like GoldenEye was, Perfect Dark is also a super challenging game at times, even on what's more or less the so-called normal difficulty mode. And there's a few standouts here and there where things really ramp up. Like the mission early on when you need to sneak into Area 51, that one in the underwater research base with Elvis where you gotta shoot your way through a couple dozen enemy guards, and then somehow keep him alive the entire time. And then probably the hardest one of all when the Carrington Institute is under attack, and you've got mere seconds to save multiple hostages from getting executed. Thanks for coming back for me, Joanna. Much like GoldenEye, there's no mid-mission checkpoints either, so you really do get used to replaying these missions over and over until you find that strategy that works best. I mean, even the first mission can have you stumped if you overlooked one of your objectives. And it's absolutely possible to screw up in the entire mission and have to restart from scratch. Over me. Now. And I've always kind of described the difficulty modes here as being normal, hard, and then go fuck yourself. And if there's a better way to describe perfect agent mode, well, then by all means, let me know it. Thanks a lot. On the downside, I mean, despite it being a better looking game than Goldeneye was, that does often seem to come at the impact of overall performance. And this is yet again another one of those titles that's got both a low and a high quality graphics setting, where the high quality mode gives you a slight increase in clarity, but at the expense of massively handicapping performance. I'm not actually sure if playing in widescreen affects this even more, but either way, once you turn it on high mode, the game more or less turns into a slideshow. And as always, like, I prefer to play it in low quality mode just so I can actually control what's happening, which is kind of essential because this campaign does not mess around. No, John, I'm okay. It's the kind of thing that puts a bit of hair on your chest and or balls. And if you're one of those kids who actually managed to 100% this thing on an old 64, well, then all I can say is, would you like to date my sister? Very professional, done, my dear. Up until recently, I'd say the best way to play through this is with the remaster they released for the Xbox 360 like a few years back. It does completely overhaul the textures and the art style though, making Joanna look like she's been fully modelled, if you catch my meaning. But the benefit of being able to run it at a smooth frame rate does wonders through the overall gameplay. And again, it shows you just how well this game holds up over 20 odd years later. Who are you and what are you doing here? If that's not your cup of tea, well, then there's also the fan-made PC port. And if you're looking for the easiest, most faithful way to play the original, well, then here it is. When it comes to that decades-old argument of which is better though, Goldeneye or Perfect Dark, liking one over the other isn't inherently right or wrong, and honestly picking a favourite between the two is like asking someone if they prefer wearing shoes on their left or right foot. Either way though, this is one of the best shooters ever made for the 64. And it's kind of weird that outside of the recently announced reboot, the only follow-up we ever got was the abysmal Perfect Dark Zero for the Xbox 360. A title which, by the way, refers to the review scores that it deserved. Overall though, the original Perfect Dark is still damn good stuff, and really embodies the old saying of, they don't make them like this anymore. Right, so where do we go from here? Well, we go from Perfect Dark to Pokemon, with the next game in the list, Pokemon Snap. <laughs> Are you serious? Developed by HAL Laboratory in 1999. Yeah, man, that's right, 1999, what a year. Alien vs Predator, Kingpin, Life of Crime, Half-Life Opposing Force, and then Pokemon Snap. <laughs> And yeah, I know this is a bit of a funny game to include in this list, but technically this is the first person shooter, if you think about it. It's just, you know, instead of shooting bullets, just shooting film. Plus it might be the only first person photography game I can think of, outside of maybe Cry of Fear. <laughs> Premise in Pokemon Snap is that you're playing as a young boy named Todd Snap. That's his real name, apparently. Who reminds us yet again that the level of parental supervision in the Pokemon universe is practically non-fucking existent. Todd's come to Pokemon Island to help Professor Oak out in his studies, by going around in a slowly moving cue ball taking photos of a bunch of different Pokemon species. And on that front, the gameplay loop is pretty simple. You're just moving slowly through all these different courses, taking photos of these little and not-so-little creatures in their natural habitat. You aim with the thumbstick, you zoom in with the Z button, then snap away with the A button. Hopefully you're not running out of film before the whole course comes to an end. And it's gameplay so simple that even a caveman can do it. Then when the course ends, you select your best shots and have Professor Oak grade them, giving you a score when it's all done. Well done. 
getting more or less points for a photo depending on how close the Pokemon is, the pose they're striking, and whether or not they're in the center of the frame. Well done! And it's an easy to understand loop that ends up becoming surprisingly addictive, especially when you start unlocking all these new items like apples you can throw at Pokemon to get their attention, or even more annoyingly, something called a pester ball which pisses them right off. <laughs> Then the final piece of the kit is a flute, which causes certain Pokemon to dance, giving you even better photo ops. Not to be confused with playing the meat flute, which is something you do way too much, kid. <laughs> you even eventually get like a turbo mode for your pod, so you can replay courses a lot quicker if you're just trying to get that one photo op you missed. And then after you've unlocked all six main courses, you then need to find these hidden Pokemon signs to access the final hidden level, to get a coveted photo of the rarest Pokemon of them all, Mew. Yeah, a Pokemon with the kind of hip to waist ratio that you often only see on OnlyFans. But to find some of these signs though is almost impossible unless you've got some kind of a walkthrough. I mean, for instance, for one of them, you need to throw a pester ball into a volcano and then quickly photograph the puff of smoke that comes out of it at just the right moment. And how the hell you're supposed to know how to do that is anyone's guess. Well done. It's kind of the same thing when drawing out some of these hidden Pokemon as well, like on the river course, you're supposed to know that baiting a slowpoke down to the river with an apple is going to have him get his tail snagged by a shelter, evolving him into a slowbro. And yeah, some people might argue that the clues are there, but I just think it's needlessly obtuse, especially considering this is supposed to be a kid's game. Then again though, like, maybe that's the point. I mean, this is 1999 we're talking about here. The days before walkthroughs or strategy guides were readily available on the internet, and a lot of the time, your strategy guide was talking to other kids in the schoolyard. I mean, I was only able to beat Medieval on the PS1 because my best mate at the time finished it before I did and knew all the secrets. As for Pokemon Snap though, like, it is kind of hard to fault the game for what it is. And all up, it's fun enough. Plus, I can totally see myself letting my own kid play this when he gets old enough to hold a controller. The gameplay is simple, the visuals are colourful, the characters actually keep their clothes on, and the Pokemon are animated well, you know, as much as you'd expect for a game this old anyway. Plus, I also appreciate that these are the OG Pokemon, man. Old school Indigo League shit, with all the absolute goats like Charmander, Haunter, and my boy Squirtle. Welcome to the team, Squirtle. Squirtle. <laughs> I love that little guy. I mean, look, I'd still rather be back at Ash's house taking photos of Ash's mum than all these Pokemon, don't get me wrong. But in the meantime, you know, I ain't got nothing against taking a few happy snaps of Psyduck, Charizard, and Pikachu. He's rocket blasting off again! Now when it comes to the all-time big dogs of the FPS genre from the 90s, it's impossible to not mention Quake 1 and 2. And if you didn't try to melt your parents' PC by turning both of these up to their maximum settings, well, then I don't think you can say you truly lived. Now I love both Quake 1 and 2 equally for different reasons, and much like Doom, part of what I liked about them was their flexibility when it came to different ports. And aside from the PC, Quake 1 and 2 would eventually get released for the Nintendo 64, with both versions again being developed by Midway Games. For the most part, Quake 64 is the same as it was on the PC, with the main difference being that it also got the PlayStation Doom treatment, mostly in the way that they added in coloured lighting, which gives off an entirely different vibe during certain levels. But then secondly, because the soundtrack is again completely unique, composed by Aubrey Hodges. Sounding like the kind of thing you'd hear if you were ever trapped inside a small submarine that had become lodged in the intestines of a cosmic deity. Aside from that, the difficulty selection from the base game is completely removed, and certain levels are also missing entirely. But this is again absolutely one of those cases where if this was the only way you could get your hands on some Quake, well, then it's far from the worst outcome. The sheer style and carnage of the original game still lives on here. In fact, I think in some aspects, I actually prefer it over the original. Like with the updated skyboxes, which now give off even more of this crazy nightmarish vibe. Not to mention all the coloured lighting makes the whole thing look like some kind of Dario Argento film. Quake 2 on the other hand offers up a completely new campaign from start to finish, following the same plot of the original game with the player being a marine sent to the alien planet Astragos, and even the general mission structure being the same. It's just that all the environments and the levels are unique to this platform, really making it one of a kind. 
The only thing it has working against it is that it's a much shorter campaign than the PC was, with 19 levels all up, taking anywhere from 2 to 3 hours to beat. Whereas on the PC, you had 33 levels and you were looking at a runtime of anywhere from 5 to 6 hours. It also does lack the music of Sonic Mayhem, again using tracks composed by Aubrey Hodges. And I'm just not sure if I'm entirely cool with that. Only because those metal tracks in the base game are really part of what gave it so much personality. Meanwhile... But what I am cool with is how you're really getting a unique campaign with this version. And along with Doom 64, it really makes it stand out against the others. Also, it should absolutely surprise no one that both of these games have been given the Night Dive treatment and been fully remastered. With the Quake 64 port being an optional mod you can play through in the recent Quake Remaster, and the Quake 2 64 port packaged in with their recent efforts from reviving Quake 2 which really makes both of these the ideal way to play each version, kind of rendering the 64 redundant in this instance. Having said that though, that's not to badmouth Quake 1 or 2 on the 64, which really do still play pretty well otherwise, all things considered. It's just that playing them now on the PC lets you experience them the way the devs probably intended. And anything that turns more people into Quake fans is alright in my books. Now, if you're into PC gaming back in the 90s, well, then chances are you played the original Rainbow Six. And if you were anything like I was, you got instantly filtered by the insane amount of customization and planning mechanics the game offered. The original Rainbow Six was really one of the earliest tactical shooters ever made, and lets you send out squads of special forces operatives into highly dangerous scenarios, usually involving terrorists, hostages, and more terrorists. But also giving you an open-ended approach to completing your mission objectives, with a high amount of realism where the next bullet could be your last. I've always said that the original Rainbow Six was a horror game, and yeah, I stand by that. I mean, the outright jump scares you get when some lone terrorist hiding in a corner was able to ambush you is the stuff that heart attacks are made of. Man down, man down. Went on to spawn countless sequels and spin-offs with a still highly popular competitive shooter in the form of Rainbow Six Siege, which has had more operatives added into it over the years than Taylor Swift's had boyfriends. Either way though, due to its popularity on the PC at the time, the original game got ported to the home consoles, namely the PS1 and the Nintendo 64. Now with the PS1 port, this was again a completely different game, including some massive shortcuts and downgrades so it could run on the more limited platform. For instance, totally simplifying all the planning aspects before a mission and limiting your squad to only three people. The version we got for the 64 though is a lot closer to the one we got on the PC, with a much more in-depth planning system and the missions mostly being identical. And this is a good and a bad thing, I mean it's good in the way that if you missed out on playing it on the PC, you can more or less get the same experience on the 64, but then it's also bad in the sense that you're really just playing a worse off version of a better game. And despite the game letting you plan out routes and drop specific waypoints and all that shit, often the best way to play this is just by going in like a one-man army, doing your best to take everyone down solo and not catch a bullet in the head. Which again, also kind of makes it feel like a horror game and how tense the whole thing feels. In fact, when you open doors, you'll often get this very horror movie stinger sound effect. Rainbow Six on the 64 also makes really good use of the controller, really putting each button to use in a seamless way. And the only thing that chafes my willy here is how slow it is to swap out to other weapons like the flashbangs. Let's just say that luckily the terrorists aren't in any kind of rush, and they'll happily stand around waiting in the corner of a room for you to throw one of these things right in their face. But the other things like changing between the rules of engagement or swapping out between squads on the fly is quick and painless. But even better than that though is that this version of the game has a two player co-op mode. And yeah, like I've obviously missed the boat on this one, you know, by roughly 20 years. But I'm sure it provided hours of entertainment with siblings and best bros blaming each other when shit hit the fan. It's definitely one of the best aspects of the Nintendo 64 was that whole plug and play couch co-op experience that we just don't get as much in gaming anymore. Yeah, and the good kind of couch experience too. The only downside is that, again, like Hexen, you're still playing a worse off version of a far more advanced game. 
Rainbow Six on the PC, for instance, had 16 different missions. Rainbow Six on the 64, though, only has 12. And with the exception of a couple of these, you'll probably blast your way through them in a couple of hours. The worst mission by far here is Deep Magic, which is again, another nickname your mum has for me. One which was also on the PC, where you gotta sneak around a skyscraper at night time, avoiding guards to disable a security system, and then download a bunch of incriminating files off a computer. And I spent more time on this mission alone than I did the rest of the entire campaign. The one positive that this mission has over the one on the PC though is that you can actually kill the guards this time. Whereas in the original you just had to avoid them entirely which was a fucking nightmare. And considering the PC version also had a second, arguably even more difficult stealth mission where you had to sneak around someone's house to plant a bug. I don't know man, maybe we should be counting our lucky stars we got off as easy as we did here. Despite some of these shortcomings though, I still think it's kind of impressive how much of the PC version's DNA they've managed to carry across. And the heart and soul of Rainbow Six is definitely here. So again, like the PS1 version, like maybe it's the nostalgia talking, but I don't think this one is all that bad. It's a little bit short in length, sure, but as I keep telling my wife, it's not the length, it's how you use it. It's not the size that counts, it's how you use it! Sadly, no Night Dive remaster on this one yet either, but hey, a guy can hope. Now every time I go back to replay that old South Park FPS, I always convince myself that it can't be as bad as I remember it is. But then after playing it for 5 or 10 minutes, I'm always reminded as to why in fact it actually is. <laughs> Developed by Iguana Entertainment, the guys worked on the Turok games and released in 1998, the game loosely follows the same plot from some of the episodes in the first season of the show. What do you mean? Which is why you go from killing rabid turkeys to mad cows, mutant clones, and eventually aliens. <laughs> and the whole thing might have been a hoot, only they paired it with some of the most repetitive and bland shooting mechanics of all time. <laughs> When you play through this thing, it's hard to not keep Turok in the back of your mind, and it's easy to see a lot of the similarities. Firstly, in the engine, which is the same one they used in Turok, with that very distinct draw distance fog and movement sway when going up ladders. But then secondly, in all the vast, empty, expansive environments that you move through. The only problem is that unlike Turok, South Park is a lot more mundane and repetitive, and for the vast majority of the combat you're just holding down the fire button and spamming a couple of weapons on the same one or two enemy types, whether it be turkeys, cows or those damn dirty aliens. Hearing the same musical jingles repeated for 20 minutes straight and the same couple of lines of combat chatter over and over. One thing you can't fault though is the creativity, with the weapons really being the kind of thing that you'd expect a foul-mouthed elementary school kid to be using. How would you like to suck my balls? Like throwing an infinite supply of snowballs, throwing dodgeballs, shooting a toilet plunger launcher, a foam dart launcher, and throwing explosive fart dolls. Uh, you want a piece of me? There's even Altman fire modes for almost every weapon too, like pissing on the snowballs so it does extra damage, or I don't know, throwing the dodgeballs even harder. But you want a piece of me? But you just can't shake that feeling of doing the same thing for every single level. Really just the same shit, different day. And there's only so many times you can batter a turkey to death with a piss-soaked snowball before it just starts to get a bit tiresome. What's even more annoying are the tank enemies that keep spawning in the little ones. And if you let one of these guys slip past, well then at the end of the level you've got to prevent them from destroying downtown South Park. And by that point, it's just like, who gives a shit? Later in the game, these tanks take the form of giant UFOs slowly hovering in the sky, and you get so distracted trying to take these assholes out in the sky that you almost forget you've got other enemies to contend with on the ground. Oh yeah, and again, no mid-mission checkpoints. So if you die at any time, it's back to the beginning of the entire level, and some of these can go on for 20 or 30 minutes. <laughs> Again too, with this version, you've got to make the hard decision of choosing to run the game in either high or low quality, with the visual differences being genuinely hard to notice. Can't see shit. But the performance differences being as obvious as a pimple on your pee hole. 
I feel like the one saving grace this has is all of those brief cinematics you get in between each level. And if you're a fan of the show, it offers up some brief and much needed moments of levity. Considering you really start to forget when you're out in a frozen wasteland murdering your 100th turkey, that this is a game that's supposed to be based off a comedy series. I mean, half the time it just feels like it's completely devoid of any humour outside of the wacky tone. I mean, throw in some kind of echoey fart effect or something at least, come on. This is also one of those games that saw a release on the PS1 as well, and if you can believe it, the PS1 version is even worse than the 64, running and looking a hell of a lot crappier, and really just being one of the shittiest shooters to ever see the light of day on the platform. <laughs> In fact, in the game's defense, on the 64, it doesn't look that bad. I mean, it's certainly colorful, the characters and enemies are modeled well, and the weapons are creative. And I actually think those brief levels in Downtown South Park are really impressive too. It's just a shame that most of the levels have a less draw distance than a hotel room full of vapors, and most of it is just going from one foggy tunnel to the next. Shut up, fat ass! The only staying power this thing might have had was the multiplayer mode, much in the same vein as a lot of the other shooters on the 64. But if you get any more than two people at once in this thing, well don't even bother man because it runs like complete shit. So overall, it's a pretty disappointing experience, with GameSpot even giving the PS1 version a 1.4 out of 10 back in the day. Heh, you know, back when GameSpot scores actually meant something. Shut up, fat ass! As a South Park fan, you can do so much better, and recent titles like The Stick of Truth and Fractured Butt Hole make this old forgotten FPS nothing more than a skid stain on the video game adaptations of this otherwise fine and wholesome series. Come on down South Park and meet your friends, man. Speaking of wholesome series, we're back to James Bond, and if you ever played or owned GoldenEye 007, then chances are you also played The World Is Not Enough. If only because it was the only other Bond-related game to ever get released for the console. Whereas the PS1 also got The World Is Not Enough, Tomorrow Never Dies, and 007 Racing. No, not again! Anyway, developed by Eurocom and released in 2000, this is another one of those times where there were two releases for both the PS1 and the N64, and also where both of these instances are vastly different. To the point that if you're looking at them side by side, you probably wouldn't even think that they're based off the same film. Whereas the version for the PS1 has clearly taken influence from the Medal of Honor games, I've always kind of looked at the 64 version as a sort of unofficial sequel to Goldeneye. I mean, for starters, it's also heavily based off the plot of the movie, outright recreating certain scenes, just taking a few creative liberties along the way. I won't make the same mistake again. There's no health pickups during the levels either, only armor. There's a heavy focus on stealth and using gadgets, but more than that, the difficulty modes affect your objectives, and the degree of challenge you get back from the AI. There's also definitely a whole lot of troll and error here again as well, where you'll often be staring at that mission fail text, not exactly sure what the hell went wrong. What the fuck did I do wrong? Which I think was also a pretty big component and learning curve when playing through Goldeneye. The whole situation is a mess. Both versions of The World Is Not Enough have a stealth mission where you're sneaking around Electra's estate, and on the PS1, this is really easy and almost kinda lenient, letting you outright punch these guards out to the point that their bodies just disappear entirely. Stop. For this mission on the 64 though, you've got to perform all these very specific tasks, and if you screw up at any moment, it often means an entire restart. Even one of the earlier missions where you've got to rescue hostages in the London subway and deal with all these gunmen can require lots of retries, until you figure out just what the game expects you to do. PS1 version also has an entire sequence where you can play Blackjack at Zukovsky's Casino, and for some reason, this one's just missing entirely on the 64. Well played, Mr. Bond. And then again on the 64, the ski chase sequence is a lot more freeform, letting the player choose where and when they want to move, whereas on the 64, this whole thing is just on rails, which I'd argue is a lot worse. But that doesn't mean the 64 version is bad, it just kind of highlights how vastly different both of these are, which in a lot of ways I kind of prefer. I mean, it's just kind of refreshing for the PS1 version to try to do its own thing, instead of just being a shitty up worse off version of what the 64 did. This is one of those games that came out towards the end of the console's life cycle, and you can really see a product here that pushes the platform to its limits, which is kind of funny to say now, looking back on it and how basic it all looks. And I might be one of the few people who thinks this, but I honestly feel like in a lot of ways, it's superior to Goldeneye. 
sure as hell looks and plays a lot smoother, the environments are often a lot larger and more complex, and all the new ways you can use Bond's gadgets to complete your objectives really makes you feel more immersed in the role. I mean, you actually have to pull these gadgets out now and can see them visually, with a lot of them being worked into Bond's whole Swiss Army spy watch. You got actual weapon reload animations too, which is something Perfect Dark also introduced. Not to mention you can jump and swim, both of which, by the way, were lacking on the PS1. The only real downside the 64 version has over the PS1 is that all of the cinematics are in engine and not FMV taken from the movie. Obviously again because of the limited size of a 64 cartridge as opposed to the extra storage space on a CD. <laughs> It's not a huge issue though, and there is a bit of novelty in seeing all these characters poorly rendered looking like Roblox people. But it is a definite downgrade either way. Still, all that's in the past. <gasps> and blocky, polygonal Denise Richards is almost a bit of a crime in the way it portrays her, compared to how she looked in real life when she was absolutely in her prime. Doctor Jones, Christmas Jones, papers please. The other thing this game has going against it is that it has nowhere near the same amount of legacy when it comes to the multiplayer mode, which is a piss poor imitation in comparison to what Goldeneye was able to achieve. But then again, that's probably to be expected considering I doubt it was ever possible for lightning to strike twice. The whole situation is a mess. But you want to know the real reason why this thing got overshadowed and somewhat forgotten? Well, that's because it had the unfortunate timing of coming out after Perfect Dark did, which completely stole all the limelight. And that does kind of makes sense. I mean, if you've got a completely new game made by the same people who worked on, you know, one of the most popular shooters on the console versus a game based off a movie that by that point was over a year old, well, then yeah, it's going to look pale in comparison. Overall, though, a bit of an underappreciated entry for the Bond series that doesn't get enough love. And one again, too, that I'm hopeful to see a remaster for. <laughs> Finally, that brings us on to the Turok series, easily one of the most recognisable and popular shooter franchises of all time, especially for the N64. And one that definitely helped get a lot of the units off the shelves and into people's living rooms. Now this is a really interesting series as well, because all of these four original games are so different from one another as well. First game is like a run and gun shooter almost, combined with a platformer. Turok 2 is heavily objective based, changing the location up entirely from level to level, and having downright labyrinthian layouts. Ammunition storage facility destroyed. And then Turok 3 is closer to the FPS campaigns of the late 90s and the early 2000s, focusing much more on story and dialogue and feeling like a tangible journey through a consistently changing game world. And then on the outskirts, you've got Turok Rage Wars, the real black sheep of the bunch, which came out between the second and the third game, and is kind of like a claims way of trying to compete with Unreal Tournament and Quake 3, being more or less just like a glorified multiplayer mode, stripping back the campaign entirely. It's also an interesting series to talk about because up until a few years ago, I wouldn't even have really recommended people play these. Due to the original versions having kind of aged horribly and the PC ports not really doing them any kind of justice either. And where those main three games are concerned, the Turok series has more or less been single-handedly preserved by Night Dive Studios, through the work that they've done remastering them. Because prior to these remasters, the only way to play them has been to hook up an actual console and play through them that way. Or like I said, those really half assed PC ports the first couple of games got. Thank you, Turok! And then in the case of Turok 3 and Rage Wars, we've been limited to original hardware or emulation. And if you're wondering why a lot of my footage is from the remasters and not the 64, well, that's because that's the only way I've been able to play these games without getting acute motion sickness. I mean, to be honest, it wasn't even until these remasters came out that I could finally beat the second game without using cheats. I mean, look, don't get me wrong, Turok 2 might be one of the best shooters on the 64, but it's also the embodiment of time being a cruel mistress. And compared to a lot of other titles from back then, it's definitely not aged the best. I mean, the frame rate is so bad, there are times, even on the low quality setting, that it really does get to the point of being unplayable. And it's just one of those games that I can only play for a short period of time before feeling violently ill. But it also does highlight the peak of that era in gaming, where graphics were really basic to the point that you almost had to use your imagination to fill in the blanks. I mean, yeah, it looked blurry, it looked foggy, and it was often impossible to make out what was 10 feet ahead of you, but at the time, it was like our imaginations let us fill in the blanks. <laughs> 
But still though, out of every entry in this video, this is really one of the best examples of an older platform being made completely redundant. And with the remasters for Turok 1 and 2, and more recently 3, there's just no reason to play these on original hardware. Soul gates destroy. Now that I've got that out of the way, let's move on to what the actual series is about. Ready? Ready as I'll ever be. Right, so the Turok in the title refers to the mantle handed down through generations of warriors that protect Earth from alien life forms, along with live streamers. Bad, amazing. Mmm, ice cream, so good. Ugh. The recurring bad guy across all these three games is a creature called Oblivion, some kind of ancient cosmic deity that has the power to destroy entire worlds. And they build this guy up over the course of the trilogy, with him only finally showing up in the third entry. Oblivion. Is it in the first game, you're playing as Tau Set, exploring multiple levels through a hub, collecting keys to unlock the latest stages, whilst also shooting and jumping along the way, trying to destroy a powerful creature called the Campaigner. The whole thing takes place in the Lost Land, which is like a gateway dimension full of different creatures from throughout the universe, from dinosaurs and aliens through to live streamers, that have all somehow found their way into this barren shithole. Basically, all you're really doing is exploring these foggy, liminal environments to find all the keys. Take on the end level boss, then move on to the next stage and do it all over again. Overall, it was simple, but it was fun. Plus, it laid the groundwork for what the rest of the series would be about, from the kinds of enemies you'd encounter through to the weapons, which always seemed to come back in one form or another. Turok 2, on the other hand, is more or less the same in terms of the basic movement and shooting, but it changes up each level completely giving you different objectives every single time, along with each level ending with you having to defend an energy totem from enemy attacks. Mission accomplished. After the events of the first game, the new bad guy is the Primogen, an alien life form that's trying to escape from the Lost Land. And only Joshua Fireseed, which is the most badass name ever by the way, now holding the Turok mantle, is able to stop him. This time he's guided by Adon, a blue alien chick who shows off way more cake than she needs to and one who didn't really provide any assistance outside of sexual frustration to any kid who played this back in the day. Greetings, Turok. How may I assist you? Hurry, Turok. And speaking of frustration, if navigating Turok 1 was like getting through a maze, well, then navigating Turok 2 is like moving through a maze that's constantly shifting, along with getting kicked in the nuts the entire time and having battery acid spat in your face. I mean, yeah, dog, this was one seriously confusing and challenging campaign, and I don't know a single person who managed to finish it on their own as a kid. Didn't help either that you only ever got like one or two manual save points for an entire level, especially considering some of them could go on for upwards of an hour. But the amount of things they improved upon the first game here on a basic level is really impressive, and it really does trump Turok 1 across the board. I mean, for starters, it easily has the best gun porn in the entire series. The sound the shotgun makes, for instance, is just pure ASMR. And even small things like being able to shoot enemies with the bow and see the arrows lodged in their bodies was technically impressive for the time. Turok 2 also introduced weapon upgrades, bigger and better variants for a lot of the returning weapons from the first game. Not to mention introducing what's really one of gaming's all-time nastiest weapons, the Cerebral Bore. I just can't think of a more gruesome weapon than one that launches an orb that attaches to someone's head, drills out the insides of their skull before detonating and vaporizing the head entirely. And I gotta say, I haven't seen this much bodily fluid flying around since the time your mother invested in a new magic wand. And I think I probably spent more time here as a kid messing around with all the different weapons and aimlessly killing things than actually trying to beat the game properly. I mean, there's a reason why Turok's ultimate cheat code, which unlocks all the levels, all the weapons, and all that stuff, is one of the most well-known cheat codes of all time, along with I did EQD. So yeah, overall, a good game which became great after getting that much-needed remaster. After this in 1999 was when they released Turok Rage Wars, the absolute outlier in the series being a multiplayer focused entry that has next to nothing to do with the other games, outside of just using the same characters and similar weapons. Now Rage Wars does have a single player mode where you can do a bunch of trials for each character, but these aren't entirely challenging or even that interesting, so most of your time spent is probably going to be in the actual multiplayer component. 
And from a technical perspective, it's not entirely bad. It looks decent enough for a 64 game anyway, and it does run pretty well on that high resolution setting. The same which can't be said about all the other Turok games. There's quite a few maps to choose from and a bunch of game modes as well, such as Monkey Tag, which might be the stupidest fucking thing I've ever seen in the FPS. But it's all let down in one major way, simply because the controls are absolutely horrendous, for two reasons. Firstly, because you can't use the D-pad to move and strafe. You can only use the thumbstick or the C-pad, with the two control options deciding which one controls which. What the fuck were they thinking? And I don't know about you, but trying to aim with the C-pad just seems like insanity. But secondly, and what's even worse, is that just like Turok 1 and 2, inverted aim is on by default, and there's no way to turn it off. And look, I don't give a shit if this was 1999, right? There's simply no reason to not include the option to toggle this at this point. I mean, I can deal with this in a single player setting, but in these faster, multi-level deathmatch maps, it's like I'm forced to ignore 30 years of gaming habits and reverse everything that I'm used to, just to simply survive. It's just a bit of a shame, because otherwise, Rage Wars really isn't that bad, even if it does just feel like a standalone version of what should have been in any of the main games. And then finally, as far as the single player games are concerned, we've got Turok 3, which is easily the simplest one in the bunch, having a much more linear campaign where it's almost impossible to get lost. This time as you play as either Danielle or Joseph Fireseed and move through five different worlds to track down and destroy Oblivion, which all ends in a pretty boring boss fight that ain't all that memorable and honestly was a bit of a letdown. The real problem that Turok 3 has though is that it just feels inferior to the previous games in almost every way. It lacks that chaotic, fast-paced movement and the shooting of the first game, which really made you feel like this badass Native American warrior. But then it also lacks the more complex and creative level design from Seeds of Evil, along with having much more stripped-back weaponry and inferior gunplay. And then finally, in terms of the multiplayer mode, well, obviously Rage Wars had it beat there too. It's kind of like the Alien 3 of video game sequels, which is pretty apt if you stop to think about it, considering that they also killed off Joshua during the intro. Ah, Joshua! Kind of similar to how Alien 3 killed off Newt and Hicks early on. Sorry, spoilers. None of this makes any sense. Even just the music is kind of lacking when you compare it to those first couple of games. I mean, the music in the first game, for instance, is all this primal tribal stuff, lots of thumping drums and quick loops, perfectly capturing that adrenaline hit you'd get when like a raptor or a poacher comes running towards you out of the fog. Whereas in Seeds of Evil, it draws upon entirely different themes for each level to coincide with the backdrop. The Port of Ardia, for instance, has an almost heroic sense of urgency, like it's constantly building towards something, as if to almost motivate the player. Whereas when you're in the bowels of the Lair of the Blind Ones, it evokes a sense of mystery and a fear of the unknown, as you venture off into these dark, winding tunnels where few men have dared to tread. The music in Turok 3 feels like a backing track to the actions on the screen, as opposed to one that actually heightens or improves it. It's just kinda there. And that's really how I feel about this third game in general, it just exists, without really adding in anything new or all that exciting, aside from Daniel's midriff. <laughs> Turok 3 was the last game in the series to be released for the 64, and also really the last decent Turok game we ever got. Because after that we got Turok Evolution, which was a bit of a disaster, and then that hilariously average reboot in 2008. What's going on, Turok? During the whole height of Unreal Engine 3 and edgy gaming culture. Hey Slade, how's it going? Really, really shitty. These first four games might have had their individual issues, but I do think the series is a sum of its parts. And overall, you can't outright hate on any of these. At the end of the day, both Talset and Joshua are two of the all-time baddest dudes, and hearing either of them shout their name after collecting another hundred of those Life Force pickups is something that's always going to live rent-free in my head. I am Turok! <laughs> I love that little guy. And with that, we're about done. Nowadays, if I made a video comparing first-person shooters on modern consoles, like between the Xbox Series X and the PS5, there'd be significant crossovers. But what I really like about going back and checking out these older platforms was that it really was a time where each of them had their own unique titles. 
which is why we never saw Perfect Dark and Pokemon Snap on the PS1, or Jumping Flash and Disruptor on the 64. That was a good thing. Despite the downsides here and there, the 64's library of FPS titles is one that's still mostly unique to the console, which is why it's always going to be interesting to talk about. And if nothing else, I'll take any excuse to shill for Doom 64 and Duke Nukem 3D. Game over.